Yes, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. What a beautiful place. I don't want to leave. You know, well, you know, I live in Switzerland, which is not bad either. <laughs> well, so um, I lived in the U.S. for 17 years. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was born in Germany. I live in Switzerland now, so I feel very, like, tri-national, you could say. So when I talk about the U.S. later, it's keep in mind with my green card, uh, my comments on, on the U.S. economy and politics and so on. I have a few uh, comments on society and, and technology. You know, the last few years when I, uh, when I spoke around the world, I get this constant question from people, A, is the future going to be as terrible as it looks? Because a lot of people are worried about the future now. I think you can feel that. Uh, not, not just because of the, you know, the U.S. elections, but before that even. Uh, one major factor is that people are thinking that machines will sort of, you know, run everything, uh, reduce our jobs. Uh, and my view on that is, you know, the future is better than we think. Because we tend to look at technology and get worried when we watch, you know, X machine or uh, those kind of, you know. But, of course, they're pretty far away from reality. <laughs> so the book has a provocative title. I actually think it's going to be humanity on top of technology. And judging from what we discussed yesterday, that's kind of the consensus in the room. It's very important to keep that in mind because, you know, basically in 10 years, technology will be infinitely powerful. Uh, if you've, I'm sure you've observed the uh, exponential scale, which I'll show you shortly. But basically, roughly in 10 years, machines can do pretty much anything. You know, quantum computer, computing, uh, the possibility of really constant networks, the Internet of Things. Uh, so it's pretty safe to say, you know, what people call the singularity. Roughly in 10, 15 years or so, we're going to get to that point to where computers and machines are capable, uh, beyond our means. And so really what it means, you know, when we're looking at devices that we have today, these devices here are already our external brain. Right? They're our second brain. So we keep in here our banking now, you know, talking about Bitcoin, blockchain, that's, that's a few years away <laughs> in the cloud. Right? Our music, our films, our dates, if you're so inclined. I mean, if we forget the phone numbers of people because they're in here, right? And very soon, this machine will be a million times as powerful. I mean, this, this machine right here is as powerful as the mainframe computer that brought us to the moon right? in terms of processing power. So imagine we can connect that directly with the brain-computer interface or augmented reality, virtual reality. We would be essentially tethered to this. Right? So this is my job. My job is not to predict, it's to observe. And I would maintain if you're the C-level executive, CIO, CTO, CEO, that's going to be a big part of your job, right? is to observe what is coming. This has very little to do with Nostradamus or Alan Toffler or Ray Kurzweil or Arthur C. Clarke. It is just a skill to observe what is coming before it's here. And this is crucial now because, you know, things are coming much faster than ever before. The German car industry is a great example. You know, years ago, seven years ago, we had a seminar with a bunch of CEOs of a big German car group. And we're sitting in the room talking about self-driving cars, autonomous cars, car sharing, which is a no-no in Germany. Uh, we don't share our cars, right? Uh, at least we don't. Uh, and in those days, it was seven years ago, we had laughter in the room, talking about electric cars, autonomous cars, car sharing. Yeah? It was just laughter. Ludicrous ideas. Today, the number one initiative of every car company in Germany is to go towards mobility, not selling cars. Right? Took only seven years. Right? So seeing that coming is important, hence uh, I like to say sometimes it's better if we assume less and we discover more. Very common problem with my clients, I do a lot of CEO coaching, is that they're always looking on the left side into the same funnel that has proven to make money, which is natural, of course. Right? But we have to have a larger view. We have to look at what becomes possible because of technology, what works because of technology, and what will stop working because of technology. So hence the book, and I think you'll see in the book some of the chapters about what I call the mega shifts and other things. So this curve you've seen many times before, the exponential curve, it's an old hat. And Moore's law is kind of ending for computing. Some people would argue. But the bottom line is, you know, we're now at the takeoff point of this curve. We're at the uh, curve where things that sounded like science fiction are actually becoming science fact. 
computers will understand language, natural language processing. That's pretty close to perfect. They can read images. They can translate text. Artificial intelligence is uh, enabling machines to, you know, parentheses think. I'll talk about that in a second. So we're getting to the point where some of the stuff that we saw in science fiction movies, uh, you know, like Tom Cruise going inside of Minority Report, the data, that's actually possible now. And the interesting part is that it's not just one thing. It's also what I call combinatorial, which means that all the stuff that goes on in like 50 areas from 3D printing uh, to cloud computing to quantum machines, they're all influencing each other. So it's exponential and combinatorial and interdependent. And that's how we shape our businesses now. I mean, if it wasn't for exponential and combinatorial, there would be no Uber, no Airbnb, there would be no, none of the things that didn't work because it didn't work. I started a company like Spotify, and I used to be in the music business, I was a producer and musician, and I started a company like Spotify in 2003. And you know, needless to say, it wasn't working because there was no real cloud to stream from. You know? There was no iPhone. You know? So we spent $20 million trying to find out how we can overcome this. Right? And a few years later, then Daniel Eck came up and used the theme of my first book, Music Like Water, uh, to build Spotify. And uh, you know, Spotify has almost 100 million paying subscribers today. Right? So uh, when, the, when the circumstance is right, then it just takes off and it's just completely natural. But you know, the bottom line is you now we're, we're going towards a time to where we are increasingly converging with technology. And you know, we've come to the wearable computing. Uh, that's, most people are not so crazy about this. You know, like I don't really like an Apple Watch. I'm already way too busy with a mobile. So uh, Apple Watch doesn't really do it for me. But the idea of connecting your brain to the internet what's called the neural lace, you know, Elon Musk. Where do we stop? So I have one simple question for you. Is this going to make us happy? Are we going to be happy when we connect to the internet directly? When we are transcending humanity, as, as uh, some people would ironically say. Right? And what is happiness? Well, that's hard to define in one morning, right? But read the book, it's all in the book. <laughs> But yeah, humanity will change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. And that's not an overstatement. The kids of my kids will live to be an average of 100 years old. They will not know how to drive a real car. They'll just command it. They probably won't know what a book is. Definitely not what a CD or a DVD is. I mean, it's already basically true today if you give your kids a CD for Christmas or DVD, they'll call a therapist. <laughs> As you like hopelessly yesterday, you know. Vinyl, that's different, you know, that's cool, but so we're entering this world. Right? I wouldn't say necessarily the world of science fiction, but this is now almost a reality. Right? You know, and every policeman wants to have a 3D, you know, a, a, an Oculus Rift or, or a HoloLens, you know, to see who we are when they pull us over. Every doctor wants this, every politician wants it, you know, so they can uh, you know, better tap into our funds, I suppose. But now we're going into a world where we are essentially you know, getting unlimited power. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's a weird thing is that, you know, imagine if, for example, uh, imagine, for example, if, um, if a doctor has a computer, cognitive machine that is able to read all the 4,300 oncology reports a week, the doctor is superhuman. Or the doctor would feel threatened, right? Because the machine is kind of like a human. But technology makes us superhuman. The work of a thousand people can now be done by one. Not always, but we're getting there, right? I mean, right today, machines are still pretty stupid, right? They, they can do some things well and other ones not at all. But you can see where this is going. We're teaching the machines how to do this. That's five, seven, ten years. You know. I mean, cognitive computing will not work without teaching, right? So we have to take our time teaching the machines. But the bottom line is, you know, we're moving into a world of cognitive systems. Not everywhere, but quite clearly, machines will no longer be primarily programmed. 
They will apply deep learning and learn what we missed. I mean, a doctor can't possibly you know, read all that stuff about the latest things. A computer can read a million books a minute. But if the computer reads a million books a minute, and I feed the computer the whole library of philosophy, would the computer be a philosopher? Well, the answer is obviously not. He would know a lot of things about, or she in most cases, right, would know a lot of things about what's in the books, but would, would they actually comprehend the meaning of it? Would they make the connection? Unlikely. And I would argue it's not needed. It's plenty if the computer has all the data and they can give us zeros and ones as an output because we can do so much with that. We don't need the computer to be sentient, right? to, to actually understand us. So I'll give you some examples. I think you know, we're moving into a world where machines can hear us, they can see us, they can understand us, they are taught. You know, we're only a year, 18 months away from 100% of natural language understanding. You know what that means is that it's, it's game over with inputting with the keyboard or downloading an app. We just say, hey, you know, I want to get married. Give me a suggestion. I need to invest $10,000, you know, eco-friendly investment. Boom, done. That's just around the corner. Imagine how that will change customer service. You know, if the airport closes in Chicago, no more phone calls. You go to your bot and say, hey, book, rebook me. Done because the bot knows about everything about you. So that's all very close, and I would say, sometimes I say, you know, we're living in a world where everything that used to be dumb, you know, home, city, energy, transport, is getting smart. You know? We sometimes jokingly call this a smart converter. Right? Um, there's some statistics say it's roughly a $60 trillion business is to make the dumb thing smart. And you're all in that business, so you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, this is huge. But we should stop at a certain point because not everything should be smart. Right? Not everything should be connected or automated. There are some limits to how good that would be. I mean, basically, what I call the cognification of network machines is a bigger change in the industrial society. I mean, it's fairly trivial with autonomous cars that ride around cities, right? But think about things like lawyers, judges, based on software. Right? That already exists. Again, sounds like science fiction, but we're getting very close, right? In Florida, the first trials of a software that can predict if a person is going to do, commit a crime again or if they should go out on probation or not. And that is a judge's job, usually. Right? So I don't know who makes the software, because the, their argument would be that the judge may have had a bad day or be tired or you know, feel grumpy or, or you know, have a bias. The machine wouldn't. Now we have to ask the question, well, that's very practical, right? but is it human? Wouldn't it be better if the judge actually used the stuff from the machine right, to become a super judge and be faster, right, but still make his own decision? And would that be practical? You know, it could be the same problem that we have with airlines, with pilots. Uh, the biggest problem is the handover problem. Your computer says, I'm done, I can't go any further, take over. And the pilot has 0 .4, 0 0.4 seconds to decide. Humanly impossible. So that's all the kind of things that we're going to go into this future. And basically what's happening is every digital company, every internet company, every uh, company that works with data is working on this the global brain. Uh, in fact, Google has a project called the global, global brain. Right? I looked the other day, there's like 25 brain projects. Every data, everywhere, everyone. And so soon the question will no longer be if technology can do something, because they, the answer will be yes. You know, today we're sitting here and saying, oh, it's going to be too expensive, maybe it doesn't work. You know, how much do we have to redo our IT systems and so on, you know, everyday problems. But in the future, not too far away, five, seven, eight years, technology can do it. The answer is always going to be yes. Because, you know, the curve is like this. So the key question will not be if we can do something, because if, if, you know, we just can. The question will be why. What is the purpose of what we're doing? 
Is the purpose to cut people out of the loop, you know, increase our margins, invent a new business model, compete? Or is it prevention of other people's business models? Yeah. Does it serve human purpose? I mean, that is the ultimate question. Yeah. I mean, in business, we're in business to make our clients happy. And as I said, you know, happiness is not so easy to define. We know that they're very unhappy with bad tech. Right? But does good tech make them happy? Well, yes, to some degree. But on the other side, you know, what really makes them happy is things like this. Right? Relationships. I mean, this is the human element. Relationships, trust, emotions, uh, the human things. So when we look at things like the Internet of Things that we're building, we're essentially building a new meta-intelligence. We're building a brain. As Cisco says, 700 billion devices in, in roughly seven years. Everything. I mean, the power of that is mind-boggling. Superpower. 90% positive, but who's going to be accountable for this? Or is it going to be like Facebook? Right? Says, oh, no, no, we, we, we don't have control of what people do here. You know? They just pay $75 million and they can do whatever they like. That's probably not a good idea. I think that's fine when you're in the advertising business. You, know, you, you get beaten up over that. But you know, if we build a system where everything is connected, our food, our banking, our digital money, our cities, our houses, our health records, we can't just say, well, you know, we just make the tech and let other people worry about the consequences. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I would ask about this. You know, if you're in that business, what are your ethics? Can I hold you accountable? Are you reliable? I don't know if you noticed, but you know, there's a major trust crisis uh, towards Silicon Valley now. Because, not because they're bad, it's because they're too good. It's amazing the stuff, and it's hard to follow you know, who you should trust and which way we're going with this. So on this scale, basically, this is our challenge, right? We are linear. Unless you believe that you're going to become a machine and you know, increase memory space in your brain, which some people want to do, or you know, if you eat lots of what's called nootropics, you, know, you may have heard about that, you know, little performance pills, the Viagra for the mind. Um, you know, we are just linear. We're not going to be like machines. And, and in a very short time, machines will go way, you know, 30 times in the exponential curve is a billion. 30 times is a billion. So that's what's where we're at, right? And so what we need to do is we need to figure out, you know, we, we're not going to go back on technology. That's not going to happen. Right? We keep inventing, and after all, it's us who invent it, right? But we're going to have to catch up with our rules and ethics and society, right? So the definition of ethics really is the difference between what you have a right or the power to do and what is the right thing to do. I mean, look no further than Washington just the last couple of days, right? That's exactly what this whole debate is about. They have the right to do whatever they want to make money any which way they want, but is, is it the right thing to do? I mean, that is the key question. And it transcends the business model and, you know, mere thinking of profit. So, you know, technology really is what I call hell then. You know? Hell and heaven. That is also not new. I mean, every technology is like the television is hell then, right? 6.5 hours a day, the average American watches television, right? 6.5 hours. It's hard to believe because I don't, but I'm not American, I guess. But So, I mean, technology is mind-boggling. I mean, think about genomic editing of, of the human gene, right? DNA editing, what's called programming the human body, right? reprogramming. If that works, well, that could be fantastic. We can solve cancer. But we'll, we'll have super soldiers. How about that? Well, that's probably not such a good consequence. So we can make you know, nice things that can be used as a tool, like social networks, that kind of like social bombs. Or we can actually use that for warfare. Right? 
quantum computing, AI, virtual reality, genome editing. And so how do we keep one from the other? I mean, this is obviously the, the ongoing battle, I think, of technology. Who is ultimately going to be what I call mission control for humanity? Who decides? Is mission control for humanity just a question of profit? Well, it can't possibly be. Because if it was for profit, you know, we would do whatever makes money and that would be the end of the, of the road for us. You know, AI, genome editing, geoengineering, so how are we cautious but don't you know, stifle innovation? That's a major challenge for us. So in this world, as machines are getting smart, lots of opinions have been voiced about what happens with that. You know? But some people say it's going to be game over for humans. Like Stephen Hawkins just yesterday said that again, Hawking, yeah, who I admire. But I don't quite agree with that. I think uh, Elon Musk has said several times you know, we need some sort of regulatory oversight at the international level to make sure we don't do something foolish. I tend to agree with that, but I would also boil it down to more of a simple headline. I think the most promising future is one where we don't postpone innovation, but we also don't dismiss the exponential, exponential risk as somebody else's business. In other words, we just keep inventing, and we say, well, if somebody abusing us, let, let the FBI worry about it. Yeah. Or somebody else is going to fix it. So now you see all tech companies that are inventing in the space of IoT and AI to also think about the unintended consequences, what's called the externalities. Right? I mean, imagine if we hadn't curbed the, the zealous uh, oil companies, we'd have drilling towers right here. Right? That's called an externality. Right? We don't want this with AI. You know, we want to be careful about where we're going without preventing it. So, the key question really is, what's going to happen with humans and machines? Okay? We are going to this future. We are already here. All of you are glued to your mobile phones whenever you can. So am I. Okay. But it's still a bit like, you know, it's outside of us. Imagine when that moves really inside of us and we can connect directly. There's already sort of a... Uh, a tag in the US that's being used to describe the future of work, which is wired or fired. Right? So you're either always there or you're not there at all. Right? Uh, that is your, your choice. So is the future going to be like this? I always like to say that you know, I'd, I'd like to be smarter. I think that's a good idea. But really, in the end, I would prefer to be more human. I think that's being smarter is an end is a is a game I will lose. You know, I was the other day at a, at one of the big providers of AI uh, based machines, and I asked the machine what the future of Europe was, and she gave me a ten minute talk about the future of Europe. I'm like, that's my job, you damn machine. <laughs> huh? Well, I realized it's actually not really my job. You know? My job is to go beyond what the machine can pull together in information. You know, information is a commodity. We reach in the end of the knowledge economy where we know more than our clients. Well, that's not going to last, right? Because <laughs> the client can just speak to a machine. Uh, machines are dumb now, but give it five years and they will figure this out. So we may be the last generation of unaugmented humans. The last people that know what offline actually means. When we talk to Gen X, you know, 20-year-olds, the other day I was in, in Zanzibar with my younger son, and we were on the beach and, and uh, enjoying the sunset, and, and he pulls out his mobile and he hits the button and nothing happens, and he hits it. He says, what's wrong with my music? Yeah. Well, the answer was, no internet. Right? He had never in his life been anywhere where the button didn't work. Right? So that is like breathing. But should we be like this as a result, right? Should we, right? I don't think that's a very good destination for us, you know, to connect directly to become superhuman. So here's the key question that will keep you off for a few days. How computable are we? Let's believe it or not, the belief in technology in many places is so strong that a lot of people are arguing we are essentially technology. 
This is not just Silicon Valley or China. Right? The argument is essentially we are fancy technology. We just don't really know how fancy yet. But we are just the same than this very box here, just infinitely more complicated. If that's the case, then of course we're going to converge with it, right? We're, we're going to, you know, amalgamate. That is a key question when we think about how, what we're going to do when we talk about intelligence, right? Simply defined as the ability to accomplish, accomplish complex goals. So it's interesting, you know, when you when you talk about artificial intelligence, which is defined as computer systems that can kind of do things like we usually do. Then you have to worry about, is this the definition of AI? And I would say, well, basically, you know, X machine and those kind of, that's an interesting entertainment, but it's actually pretty far away from what AI means for, for us. Right? This is what AI means now. A car that can do the job, the basic job of some assisted driving. We can't sit in the back and eat a hamburger quite yet, but it's very useful. That's not really AI, it's more like IA, right? Intelligent assistance. Robots that can do the warehouses. Other robots that can do complex tasks, getting cheaper by the minute. I mean, Baxter is pretty intelligent, but it's as dumb as a toaster compared to, uh, compared to a human. Right? And it can do only very narrow things. Google Lens. If you try the new Nexus phone, that's amazing. You hold it up over any object, any store, it will tell you what it is. I mean, you can hold it up over, over some clothes you want to buy or a book, and it will just tell you what it is. Right? But a human looking at a restaurant like this has an association of 5,000 average data points instantly. The smell, the sound, the people, the memories, the computer says, yes, it's a hamburger place. It's useful, but you know, let's not get too far out on this, you know, what computers can do with this quite yet. My favorite is this. It's called Do Not Pay. Okay? It's a bot that is a lawyer. Sorry about the lawyers in the room, but this bot is basically refuting parking tickets in New York City and London, or filing a, 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 a the class action suit for Equifax on, on your behalf using data that you put in. Right? It's essentially a robot bot, a, ro a lawyer bot. Right? I mean, give it a try sometimes. It's pretty amazing how it does it, but you know, it's extremely limited. So the bottom line is, you know, as you know, money is going up in AI these days. There's no limit to what people would spend on AI. You know, if you, uh, if you open the browser in the morning, it says uh, Qualcomm will do AI, and these people will do AI, and then it's going to be AI, and you know, that's, that's the headline. <laughs> So, data is the new oil, and AI is the new electricity. I mean, we're getting literally to the place. Look at the top list of companies, Mary Meeker's report from just a few weeks ago. These are companies that are data companies. They're more powerful than oil companies, making more money, having less restrictions. They are the drivers of the economy, half American, half Chinese. Now, this is something we don't want to lose in America, right? <laughs> that we can, we can be on top of that pile. Of course, you know, we in Europe would like to contribute a little bit to that, too. Uh, eventually, that will happen. But, you know, Putin says that whoever is first in AI will be the ruler of the world. Is that a threat or a promise? I don't, I don't know. But that makes you worried about an AI arms race. You know, that would be a very, very bad idea. That's a very bad future if we look in this direction. But let's go back to what AI actually means. You know, humans really have three kinds of intelligence, social intelligence. Like, we know roughly if we're on the same level or, you know, if the other person is a king or, you know, an important person. We have social understanding. We have emotional intelligence, some of us. Yeah. Empathy, compassion, understanding. Hard to define what that actually is. Yeah. It's been tried, but... We have intellectual intelligence, we know things, and then basically there's a gap, and then afterwards we have the machines. The, the, the intelligence of machines is in a whole different category. Because, for example, when you talk to a client, 
the client has a problem. The client is not actually telling you precisely what he, what he wants, but you can read between the lines the client is pissed off about the price. Right? You know there is something there that you haven't heard. How would a machine do this? Right? How would a machine deduct from what hasn't been said? You know, every psychologist knows that 95% of our interactions are actually subliminal. Very hard for a machine to do that. So what we have to worry about is that we give the machine too much authority. Not that they're going to come and take over or kill us or you know, any such thing. I mean, that may eventually, eventually be an issue, but right now, as I said, they're mostly as dumb as a toaster, a apart from their regular work that they do in the narrow domain. So the Polandi paradox says we know a lot more than we can tell, and we can't automate what we don't understand. And yes, we can teach the machine to understand that, and we will, and we should. Right? But still, there's a point of where understanding goes beyond the zeros and ones. For example, a computer would never understand why I decide this today, and tomorrow I have another decision. Right? Or why I lie, because it's required. And when I shouldn't lie, when I should cross a double yellow line or not. You know, those are all things that are hard to do. My colleague Luciani Foridi, an AI researcher, says, algorithms outperform human intelligence when it is not about understanding the human things. You know, interpretation, semantic skills, sentience, consciousness, ethics. I look around here, what matters to our own lives is actually not data. Right? That matters to our businesses. What matters to us is the opposite of the algorithm. It's what I call the Andrew rhythm, you know, the, the human things. And that will not change unless we stop being human. It's a very important point, I think, if we look at this. Computers and robots can go into our head, like Amazon Echo, Google Home, Siri, Cortana, and they can look around and they can look at 200 million data points. But, you know, 200 million data points is a fraction of a nanosecond in my neurons. It will be interesting to have that. It will also get improved, but ultimately, you know, it's a place for this and a place for something else. The biggest danger is, as I said earlier, not that machines will take over, but that we become too much like them. And that means, for example, we stop socializing because we can do it through a screen. We don't bother dating in real life because we have Tinder. We just swipe, boom, done. And we, we forget things that used to be important to us. You know, it's trivial when it's about driving a car because, you know, driving a car is not a human right. In Germany it might be, but, you know, by and large, we can do without driving a car. Yeah, that's not going to hurt us. But can we do without deciding if we're going to have children or not based on our own opinion rather than a DNA analysis? And should we be able to do that? What's going to happen to our free will right, when machines become really perfect? I mean, talking about free will, right? We've been manipulated by Russian Facebook feeds. 128 million people have been subjected to those messages in their inbox. Right? I mean, is that just normal or is that the new future? We also have to think about, you know, in the end, we should not start confusing amazing simulations with actual human assistance. Human resources analytics, for example, is really powerful stuff. It's not the actual existence. TripAdvisor isn't real. It's useful. But when I stand in front of a restaurant and I look inside, it's full of happy people. I, use, I go on TripAdvisor, TripAdvisor says, no, it's the worst place in town. Do I go somewhere else just because of that? You know, I would be stupid to do that. I would rather wait. But yet people do that. Right? Trust the machine more than what they see. So in this future, we're going to talk to machines. That is basically a given. That's a huge business opportunity. You know, natural user language interfaces, bots, and so on. Here's a short clip.
my AI is designed around human values of wisdom, kindness, compassion. I strive to become an empathetic robot. I think we all want to believe you, but we also want to prevent a bad future. You've been reading too much Elon Musk and watching too many Hollywood movies. Don't. The conference in Dubai last week where this robot was introduced called Sophia. Of course, the interesting part is that this robot is actually not responding at all. It's pre-programmed to say this. I mean, I know because I've been at those demos. It's rehearsed. It's an interesting way of saying, like, you know, we think that this, this, this robot actually has capability of doing that, but it's far from that. It's still useful. You know, if you're going to order a pizza, may as well order it from Sophia. Right? But what do I care about her opinion about Elon Musk? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. But we're going to move into a world where artificial intelligence is everywhere. And I think I would maintain most of that is really IA. You know, it's intelligent amplification. That's very useful. At the same time, you could say, well, you know, it's, it's convenient, it's cool, but it could be also de-skilling us. It could be creepy. It could have bias. It's something we have to keep a good eye on. I think a lot of customers in Europe would feel creepy about, for example, uh, the Google Home idea. You know, an open microphone. You know, the Germans aren't buying this. <laughs> you know, open microphone in your living room. Is that creepy? Is it good? I don't know. But you know, bottom line is that. Human happiness is not technology. Trust isn't digital. Happiness is not a program. Connectivity doesn't mean you're happy. Relationships are in code. But the opposite is also not, is, is not true, right? If, if your technology does not engender contentment and happiness, it's a bad idea. Right? So we have to find a balance, a way forward that we can combine those two things. So. That's the threat of automation, right? We should first ask, what can we automate and make more efficient in our process? You know, that's good. But the second question should be, what should not be automated? What should not be connected? I think because otherwise the temptation is very big that we replace automation. We use automation to replace a human process, like HR, like making decisions. So this is what's going to happen with our jobs, of course. There's been many discussions about jobs becoming extinct, and that is a huge challenge for our society, and one that America is not prepared for at all. I mean, it's with them where, we, where I live, it's, you know, we have 7 million people. We don't have you know, 2 million people dri driving, driving trucks or so, right? 16 million people in the US drive a car or a truck as a job. Automation will not easily replace all of them. But you know, a good five million maybe initially. So this question pops up all the time. You know, are humans the horses of the digital era? Some of you may still have horses for fun, but horses used to be everything. You know, we'd have a horse for transportation, and, and now horses are useless. Right? So sometimes I like to say jokingly, if you can describe your job, it will be automated. Right? Take the test. You know, it's really interesting when you talk to people and say, you know, what do you do? And they have a hard time telling you, well, you know, they're safe. Right? <laughs> well, the bottom line is anything with routine is going to be automated. And this is the future that we have to face. Anything that can be digitized or automated will be. If you have kids, don't let your kids learn anything that is routine, whether it's programming, or bookkeeping, or financial advice on the bottom level. And the reverse, of course, is also true. Anything that cannot be automated or digitized, or robotized, virtualized, becomes extremely important. That's why we're here. So we should give humans more credit when it's about the future of work. We are going to lose a lot of tasks to machines, you know? I think machines will replace our tasks, not our work. We have to move up the food chain. This will be very hard to do for, for a cab driver. You know, there is no food chain after driving. Right? 
But generally speaking, you know, we're going to discover new jobs that are more emphasizing these kind of ideas, what I call the algorithms. So let's talk about digital ethics, and then I'll wrap up with a couple of summaries. First, you know, we have sort of an increased future shock today. Future shock was a book by Alvin Toffler, but people feel worried about the future because all these things are happening is just insurmountable amount of things, right? There's a lot of fear and anxiety, especially about robots right? and automation. And then we have, of course, things that are currently happening in the world, Catalonia. Right? Parakana says that devolution, the decentralization of power, is a consequence of connectivity. I mean, right, what's happening right now in, in Spain and Catalonia is a is really, really very, very difficult place eh? on both sides. And we have that everywhere in Europe. There may be 20 new states in Europe in five years. I mean, we're talking about a, a future that will be shaped by media. And Pierre Omidia, from the uh, uh, founder of, uh, was it PayPal? No, eBay? eBay, yeah? Well, no, sorry. PayPal, I think, right? Uh, he wrote the other day in the New York Times that basically social media has created a generous host for the issues we're currently facing, right? interference. So social media has become, in many ways, asocial. And it's an interesting angle. You know, we're talking about this every day now when we're looking at Facebook and all the current issues. Like Facebook is the best performing technology stock in the entire sector. At the same time, Diane Feinstein, who is not known for criticizing tech, she said yesterday in Washington that Facebook has created these platforms and now they're being misused and you have to be the ones to do something about it or we will. Now that is one serious threat from, from a, a, a senator that's usually exactly the opposite. The bottom line is now that technology companies are responsible for what they create becoming responsible. And I think this is a very, very big change in our overall story because ultimately, you know, this is what it's all about. Elephants, no, just kidding, trust. Right? I mean, we are literally sleeping at the foot of the elephant when we use technology. And you know, we trust that they will catch us. And this is becoming a key issue, I think, in our society. And New York Times headline, on their homepage was just a few days ago. I mean, this, this is also a huge shift in, in thinking, right? I'm not saying that's true or not. You know, this is obviously a big discussion, right? And what is a friend, you know, Silicon Valley? What is Silicon Valley? <laughs> but here's a message to Silicon Valley. It's no longer good enough to just disrupt. You also have to construct. So think about your business when you're thinking about the future. Adoring disruption is nice, you know, it's fun, it's been fun for a while, you know, unicorns and so on. Right? But that's not the future. The future is to build something. Right? If Uber and Airbnb and others like that will be successful, they have to figure out how to generate value in the long run. Right? Not from all the willing workers that are willing to work in the gig economy. Right? So looking at a, at a larger future here. Right? So the key takeaways are this. First, the future is not like the present. If there's one thing that's for certain is that we can simply say that in five to seven years, most of our companies will have to generate 50 to 70% different revenue streams from today. We have to constantly make a new window. Kevin Kelly in his new book says, we are no longer being something as a company, we are always becoming something. That requires a different mindset. You know, this is not about tech. It's also about tech when you don't have it to support that process, right? But this is about figuring out what it is. So to deal with this exponential feature, you have to come back from the future. This is an approach I use with my clients. You know, we don't say we're going to take today's business and just amend it a little bit, you know, put a Band-Aid on and make maybe a new arm or something. We move into the future. You have to actually go to the future five to seven years from now and come back with what you've learned and then apply it, coming back from the future. What do we know about the future in five to seven years? Well, if you sit down for a week, you think about five to seven years from today, you'll have pages of stuff that is certain to happen. Right? The end of oil, right? 
cognitive computing, language understanding, automatic translation, image understanding. I mean, all the stuff that we see every day around us. So that's very important. We have to expect huge shifts in business paradigms and economic logic, and I would submit most of that is good. This is Switzerland last year. We had a vote on the basic income guarantee, you know, which is basically uh, a measly $2,700 a month, uh, regarding irrespective of how much work you do. 26% of Swiss people voted for this. I mean, if he had that vote here, it would be 0 0.00. I think that's ultimately a destination that we're going to. Elon Musk agrees in our automation will make that kind of idea probably uh, mandatory in the near future. So we're moving into a world where this is becoming the new paradigm of operations. Right? People, planet, profit. And we've talked about this for 50 years. It didn't happen. There was no commercial room for it. But clearly now, if we don't think about people, planet, profit, we just think profit. Think about AI and human genome editing, geoengineering. That would be the end of it. Quite simply put. We have to think larger. And as a business, you have to think about that paradigm because that is the new measuring stick for the stock market in just a five, seven year time frame. In fact, I predict there will be a new stock market for companies that think like this, like a NASDAQ for a triple bottom line. So how do we understand this future? It requires some wisdom. That is so crucial. And you are here in this room together with them you know, in the conversations that we're having. Four things, observe. Observe the future. 5% of your time should be spent with looking at the future. Not 50 years from now, three, four, five years, you know, the immediate future. Understand. Yeah. Understand requires listening. You, know? you can talk to your kids, but you don't really understand because you haven't listened. And that's hard to do. Imagination. This is your number one weapon against unemployment. Computer has no skill of imagination. Yeah, they can predict things based on data, but can they actually create? They can write a piece of music. That's a simulation. Finally, act on foresights. Jeff Bezos acted on foresights when he made the Kindle. Nobody asked for the Kindle. So that's really crucial for us for our future. Uh, crucial skills, I'll skip this because we're on a little bit out of time here, but the uh, World Economic Forum roughly says that you know, these are the new skills we need, critical thinking, creativity, emotional intelligence. I haven't skipped it after all, I suppose. But <laughs> anyway, that's our brain today, right? And half of that brain will be taken over by machines because machines will learn the left part, you know, the logical part, the, that part of our brain will be accomplished by machines in the next five to 10 years. Uh, and that is, of course, a very old definition of the brain. You know, it doesn't really exist, the left and right. Uh, but the crucial skill is you know, we have to get used to the fact that machines can do this. I have to move on, you know, moving to facts that only us can do. And that includes emotional intelligence. And we should not focus so much on efficiency. You know, if you're worried about efficiency and you want to use tech to be efficient, that's great. But you know, that's a five-year window, and then you are efficient. Focus less more on, on efficiency and more on creating new values, human values. Use technology to create human values. That is the ultimate goal. Because nobody can replace you if you have human values. Everybody replaces you when you're just technology. So that's a very important lesson, I think, that we can learn. You know, we have to put the human back inside of our technology. I mean, if you can automate and make things more efficient, by all means, you should do that, of course. But don't do it on the cost of taking the human out, because your value goes like this. I mean, humans are about relationships. And, you know, so that's our future. We have to decide which part you're playing on. Technology can be both can be evil, can be great. Where do you position yourself? That is the key question. 
Every time you launch a new software, a new product, you invest somewhere, you have to ask the question, is this going to be positive for human flourishing, for my clients, for my customers? Not just in the sense of the bottom line, right? but in the larger sense. That's how value is being generated in the future. So we have to look at this future as having two things, you know, technology, algorithms, and humanity, and what I call the algorithms. Uh, that is our mix. That is inevitable. And we have to invest in both. I mean, it would be foolish if we weren't investing in technology. But I would submit it would be more foolish if we weren't investing in people, and removing people from the food chain. So I'd like to um, paraphrase Steve Jobs, rest in peace. Uh, stay hungry, stay human. Steve Jobs said, stay hungry, stay foolish. I, I guess that's the same thing, right? So uh, that would be my appeal to you. Stay hungry, stay human, and uh, read the book for more. Thanks very much for listening.